I'm a, an environmental biologist and you know, I, I wouldn't even say advantages. I would say it's essential to use mathematics in our work. And, the, and the, w there are a number of reasons for that. One is that we're, we're trying to understand how living systems respond to the environment and to changes in the environment. And or, you know, that means that we're looking at processes that involve millions, billions of organisms, but somehow from that we need to distill general behavior so that we can provide uh, scientists, uh, educators, and decision makers with some insight into what's going to happen. And the only way to boil down all of that incredible diversity into something that people can get their heads around is to analyze it mathematically. In, in building the National Ecological Observatory Network, We've had to figure out how to take a very finite number of sites and resources and produce the maximum amount of information about the entire continent from that limited uh, set of, of sampling locations. And in order to do that, um, we didn't have the luxury of trying it a few different ways and seeing what worked. So we had to use mathematical models and essentially create a mathematical model of the real world, sample that model in a way that was similar to what we were thinking about with our actual physical observatory, and then see how well we could reconstruct the patterns that were produced by the model. In other words, we, we used the model to produce truth. Um, we we used the model to produce a, a, a picture of biological diversity or carbon flux or whatever property was of interest for the whole country so that we knew the answer. And then we sampled it and we limited ourselves to how much information we could get at 20 or 40 locations. And then said from those 20 or 40 locations, could we actually predict the answer that you get if you have all of the data everywhere? So um, mathematical modeling was an absolutely essential part of designing the observatory. That approach together with lots of statistical analysis of existing data, satellite data, um, we really couldn't have designed the observatory in a, in a way that we could defend to our colleagues without having done these mathematical analyses. Uh, a lot of, of my career-long interest has been on the role of the terrestrial biosphere in uh, influencing atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations. So how does changing climate or varying weather and climate, patterns of human land use and other processes, how do they affect how much carbon uh, the biosphere, the land biosphere, exchanges with the atmosphere each year? Um, one of the things that, that we've observed is that there's a, a, a sense visually in looking at, at atmospheric concentration changes, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration changes, is there, there appears to be, there appear to be um, significant variations from one year to the next. And uh, in the, in the 1990s, my students and I started analyzing these variations in the atmosphere as a time series. And what we found after analyzing the characteristics of that time series using an approach called Green's function analysis was that uh, climate variation in one year had impacts on, on biospheric carbon exchange that appeared to last for at least two or three years and that were somewhat oscillatory. That is, processes in one year that were related to photosynthesis had consequences that were reflected in respiration in the following year. And we observed this in a correlational sense. We couldn't really prove any connections um, by, again, as I said, analyzing the data using uh, reasonably sophisticated mathematical techniques. Interestingly, we then took that insight and used it to design a very large manipulative experiment that allowed us to test the hypothesis that we, uh, that we were able to formulate based on mathematical analysis 
of global observation data, we were able to test that hypothesis using an extremely large uh, enclosure experiment. And th this is the way that I like to think about mathematics and theory is that one is constantly in a, in, in a sort of a tension between the development of questions, which often involves mathematical or statistical analysis, and then finding innovative ways to compare those predictions from theory against observations or experiments. When you're interested in the global carbon cycle, it's, it's hard to do simple laboratory experiments. So you have to find very, I think, uh, innovative ways of using data, theory, and models together um, to answer questions, to test and reject hypotheses about phenomena that occur over you know, large fractions of the entire planet. So I think that's actually a great question. How can mathematical biology contribute to the scientific world? And I'll answer that in, in, in several ways. First of all, from within the culture of science, mathematics is the language of science. Um, it's one of the languages of science. You know, the, the genetic code is probably another one of the languages of science. But whenever we're dealing with large numbers of individuals, very complicated feedback processes. Um, I think the most succinct way we have of capturing those relationships is with mathematics. So in our work as scientists, mathematics really helps us to do our job. But mathematics is really the one common language of science. So when we're trying to understand processes that are interdisciplinary, that involve biology and physics, or biology and society, economics. The common language that we all, as scientists and scholars, have together is mathematics. So by being able to capture our biological phenomena in mathematical language, we're able to talk about them with scientists who have different backgrounds. And then finally, often mathematical analysis of biological problems allows us to distill a very complicated situation into a few principles. And then putting those mathematical principles into world words, we can often communicate outside of science. Whereas if we were trying to explain in words the complexity of evolution and multiple organisms interacting with each other in complicated ways, we lose people's interest. Whereas when we can say things like the tropics are more diverse, we have a way of, of boiling down these very, very rich, complicated disciplinary discourses into something we can talk about more broadly. So I think math helps us do our job every day. It helps us cross boundaries to the other sciences. And paradoxically, I think it can be a step along the way to being able to communicate with a non-specialist audience.